Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket podcast. This is a podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. As always, we would like to thank all our listeners for their continued support. Please do listen to us and spread your spread the word about our podcast to your uh, cricket loving friends. If you haven't done this already, please remember to subscribe to our podcast on the platform you're listening to us on, be it uh, Podbean, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Castbox, or anything like that. You can find us by searching for Armchair Cricket Podcast on any of these platforms. Uh, do not forget to leave us a rating, preferably a five-star rating, and uh, provide your feedback. You can reach out to us by email. Our email address is armchair.cricket at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at armchaircrickpod. You can also find us on Facebook. Uh, all the links uh, are provided in the description uh, below. Now, continuing with our focus on World Cup team selection, uh, we have a special feature today on the Indian cricket team. Uh, we are delighted to tell you that we are joined today by a friend of the podcast, DJ, from Edges and Sledges podcast for this section. Now, before we do that, uh, let me introduce my co-host, Ajit. Hello, Ajit. How are you, man? Hi, Giri. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Well, I mean, again, it's been a, a very hectic sort of a week with work. But uh, outside of that, uh, you know, things are going good. How about you? Yeah, hectic week, but uh, we're almost reaching the end of the IPL, right? And uh, yeah, nothing much. I think, I mean, we, we we're also looking forward to the World Cup. Um, of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, there are some international matches to fill the lull, of course. Some pe- some teams already prepping for the World Cup, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I, I also like to say I started my season uh, a couple of weeks back mm. already. And this weekend was specifically terrible because we played uh, in the northern part of Netherlands. And mm. uh, it was nine degrees and we played a full 40-hour match. And it uh, it showed, the phone showed the feeling was like six degrees. I, I played the whole match in a jumper or in a, you know, a rain, really? raincoat or a windsheet or whatever you call it. So oh. it was a new so one cricket, for me. Cricket can become a winter sport now. At least in Netherlands, it sometimes feels like that. Right now, yeah, it's, it's, it's a horrible patch of weather right now, I think. Uh, um, but I think it's going to get better in the coming days, maybe in a week or so. Uh-huh. It should come back to double figures. I hope yeah. for your sake uh, you get to play in warmer conditions because I think it, it probably hurts when you catch the ball, right? It's oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I dropped one and I know it hurt. Oh. So, I mean, mm-hmm. as they say, from your mouth to the ears of the guards, right? I hope yeah. <laughs> the weather improves. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, going forward, I think we can quickly take a look at the trivia question from last week, right? So, mm-hmm. the trivia question from last week was also, as we always do, it was centered around the team that we discussed in, uh, you know, that episode. So the team we discussed last episode was England. So based on that, the trivia question from last week was, who bowled the first ever ball in an ODI and who faced it, right? So this is Garth McKenzie of Australia bowling to Jeffrey Boycott of England. This was in the first ever ODI. In 1971, test was a sort of rained out when the first three match, uh, days of the match was rained out. There was no point in playing... Uh, test match or continuing with the test match. So they, uh, you know, this was played down under and this was already March. And so they decided to play a one day. So this is how one day cricket sort of began, so to say. It was already played in, uh, it was called the John Players Leagues in England, where it was played as a competitive tournament, but there was no international, you know, cricket. So Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, the two teams played and this match had Garth McKenzie bowling to Jeff Boycott. So this was actually the first ever ODI. And therefore, Jeffrey Boycott is the first batsman to face a ball of Garth McKenzie. Right? What this is irony. the answer to our trivia question. Yeah, what an irony. <laughs> <laughs> right? Why? Jeff Boycott could have been the best ODI batsman. Well, no, that's well, a joke. I mean, but uh, I don't know. I think he, he, because he played the first ever ODI, I think we have to give him, cut him some slack. Uh, because I think everybody played with a different mindset back then to what we mm-hmm. see right now. Right. Right. Um, right. Well, 
I mean, look, he does have a very rapid list a hundred. Uh, it's not uh, common knowledge, but this guy hit a very rapid, I think, almost run a ball hundred in a list a mm-hmm. at some point in time in his career. So mm-hmm. there was never any doubt whether this guy could bat, right? It was more like he was always intent on defense because that was he felt the best way to protect his wicket. So mm-hmm. I mean, this is a longer discussion for sure, but yeah. uh, his 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 um, let's say his approach brought results. And uh, I think that's that's the main thing. But it's interesting to know that uh, uh, Jeff Boycott <laughs> faced the Indeed. ball there. Right. Okay. Moving on. Let's now uh, look at the World Cup preview section. We have so far uh, reviewed nine teams, or previewed nine teams, and this leaves us uh, the last team that's participating in the upcoming World Cup, which is India. Before we do that, we have a very special guest joining us uh, for this section. So, uh, hello, DJ. Welcome to the podcast. Hello there. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me on. Delighted to be on the Armchair Cricket Podcast. Thank you. So, this is DJ, who's from the Edges and Sledges Podcast. And uh, we are very happy to have him on the podcast as well. Can I also just congratulate you guys on your 25th episode? So, you've got your quarter century done. Wow. So, well done on that, guys. Always good to see fan podcasts doing well. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. I hope we can keep this going uh, with, uh, you know, with the summer commitments coming up and whatnot. Uh, let's see how it goes, though. All right. So um, today's team on focus is India. And um, before we get into sort of Indian squad and, you know, how they might perform in the group stages and such, let's take a quick look at how India has been performing uh, over the World Cups. Right. So in, India is one of the stronger teams at the World Cups, at the 50-hour World Cups. Right. So uh, if you look at their overall record, uh, they have played 74 matches, won 46, lost 26. They have tied a match and one of their matches has been no result. Right. So they have a 62 percent or more of a winning record at World Cups. And we know that, you know, their best results have been in 1983 and 2011, where they were winners. Uh, and then in uh, 2003, they were runners up. Also, they have been semifinalists. Uh, three other times so in 87 in 1996 and in 2015 so uh, this is a very strong Indian team and India usually mm, performs well at the World Cups we've seen this so um, going forward if you were to quickly look at um, you know who are the leading bowlers and batters for India so any guesses DJ who's the leading batter for India at World Cups I think it's uh, it's one man who's the leading batsman of all time in one-day cricket at the moment, and it's got to be Sachin Tendulkar. I mean, he's played him. more than, more t- World Cup cricket than anyone else, right? Absolutely, he's played 45 matches, right? Scored 20 to 78 runs at an average of 56 on nearly 57, with 600s and 1550s, right? Also, I mean, this is this he's also the highest uh, scorer across all World Cups as well. But how many then, World Cups uh, has he played? Uh, it? I think he'll, he's played six World Cups as well, hasn't six, he? Six, along with the other guy well, you mentioned. You know, Javed Miandad. It's got to be Javed Miandad, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a good pick. That is a good one, Kitty. So, um, you know, um, okay, if you look at the other top five, it's 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 not, there are not a lot of surprises. I don't know if you've had a look at the link, DJ, but uh, do you know who's top uh, two, three, four, and five? On this list? So I haven't managed to actually look at the list, but given the characters involved, mm-hmm. Sachin will be top, Ganguly yeah. will be there, Dravid's going to be there. So those are the big three. Perfect. I'd say Sevag will be Good there. Good God, man. I can't believe you've not seen this list. I think and then right. it's going to be between Yuvraj Singh and uh, Azharuddin, perhaps. Fantastic guessing. You got the top six nearly right. So Who, which one have I got wrong? Yuraj is six. Oh, okay. 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 That's the only thing. But you got Fair the top enough. six. You got the top six nonetheless. Fair so enough. excellent, excellent uh, analysis, I would say. So, but the only thing is, well, Ganguly has played only 21 matches. Dravid 22, Sehwag 22, Azharuddin 30. Yuraj has played 23. So, um, Kapil Dev has played 26, but he's seventh. And then Kohli, who's eighth currently, has played 17. And of the current batsmen, you have um, Dhoni, who's outside of top 10. You have Dhawan, Raina, Rohit Sharma, and Rahane. All of these people are outside top 10 as well. So if you look at the records, Ganguly is second. He's made 1,000 runs, 1,006 runs. 
and uh, in 21 matches and yeah you can imagine he's a full 1200 runs 1250 runs behind tendulkar right dravid has made 860 runs out of 22 matches uh, sehwag 843 out of 22 and azaruddin has made 826 out of 30 so azaruddin and sehwag have their averages under 40 uh, ganguly also averages 55 near very nearly 56 and dravid averages more than 60 right and when it comes to gavaskar gavaskar is ninth on this list as well so uh, it's 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 a very interesting list ajay jadeja sort of also slips into the top 10 which is very interesting for me right if you were to look at uh, bowlers so uh, any guesses who's the top most successful indian bowler at the world cups tj mm at kum i want to say kumble Kumble may have taken quite a lot of wickets in '96, but he didn't play 2011. So it's going to be Kumble, um, Shrinath. Shrinath played a lot of games. Zaheer Khan, of course, um, with that great knuckle ball he bowled to Strauss. Mm-hmm. And then Nehra. All right, good guesses. No. Uh, Giri, anything to add? Anybody to add? Um, I think uh, Kumble, Shrinath. uh it probably kapil dev mhm and because yuvraj singh did so well in the 2011 world cup i would also say he's in the top 10 wow um, okay. and i think zahir khan as well i i, I can only remember i mean uh, think of these names are there any surprises here well i mean you've got most of them right so zahir khan is top 23 matches 44 wickets shrinath is second 34 matches 44 wickets kumble is third 18 matches 31 wickets kapil dev is fourth 26 matches 28 wickets manoj prabhakar is the bowler top 5 wow right 19 matches 24 wickets that's a good one yeah right but would then, did he get it with off spin or was he bowling safe <laughs> i think that's an excellent <laughs> question i think uh, we'll have to ask him shilankan batsman about that for sure um <laughs> but uh, well i mean the other people in the top 10 madan lal is 6 and then um, you have yuvraj indeed who 7 23 matches 20 Harbhajan Singh is 8 21 matches 20 and then Bini is 9th 9 matches 19 and Umesh Yadav right so 8 matches 18 Umesh Yadav again okay. Ro- Ro- Roger Bini right not, not Roger Bini yes not, <laughs> not, not the son not Stuart not Bini no they didn't play in Bangladesh i think i mean yeah yeah but Umesh so, Yadav has played only one world cup right i think he must have been matches. only the 2015 yes. world cup precisely precisely it's nice that's a good uh, record to have no nah, i think he, and it was sort of i think he was also on, on the um let's say outskirts of this squad i mean if he had done well in the 2019 let's say the ipl was there a chance he could have been a bolter in the squad dj do you think he's one of those people who missed out personally i don't think so i mean um i saw him go for 25 runs in the last over while defending 26 right against uh, dhoni so <laughs> Uh, I know one of my co-podcasters on the Edges and Sledges cricket podcast, Ashwin, is a is a big fan of uh-huh. Umesh Yadav, especially with the hairband and stuff. So right. Um, right. he will probably agree with you that Umesh has missed out. But I mean, Umesh has been far too inconsistent, I think, with the white ball over a long period of time now since the last World Cup, in fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the new boys coming in i mean they, you've got saini you've got avesh khan khalil you've got uh, sandeep warrior mm-hmm. i i think umesh's days as a white ball bowler are done and i don't see him fitting into the red ball squad anytime soon either so i'm afraid my answer is no but there will be others on my podcast and our podcast that actually disagree <laughs> I can imagine. I have I've heard your discussions with uh, yeah, your co-podcaster who thinks uh, Umesh Yadav in a headband is a great thing. Uh, and I don't f- disagree much. I think one place where I would slightly disagree with you is in test matches when playing in subcontinental conditions. I think I think they like the surprise factor that Umesh Yadav brings. And the surprise that you know how you you have no idea how he'll bowl sort of surprise mm-hmm. factor. <laughs> I think um Yeah, yeah. I mean, this. I mean, uh, Ajit, don't you think he had a bit of a revival under Anil Kumble's uh, uh, period as the coach uh, of the Indian cricket so. team? I think Anil Kumble gave him more chances, mm-hmm. which allowed him to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, bowl more consistently in red ball cricket. But mm-hmm. now he seems to be out of uh, the reckoning again. The Ravi uh-huh. Shastri, sort right. of. I mean, I think Shami is also very strong. So Shami, uh, when if Shami is playing, I don't see Umesh Yadav playing with him because we have Bumrah, of course. 
Plus, yeah, plus I can, if I can just add on to that, Umesh did very well, I think, on, in the Kumla era, as you pointed out, as well as um, before Bumra burst onto the scene early last year. So he did very well. My uh, main memory of him actually is bowling mm-hmm. a containing spell against Australia in the second test match in Bangalore, along with, I think it was Ishant, and we gave away very few runs on that day. And that, I think, was the best I've seen him bowl in test matches as a containing bowler, not taking many wickets, but mm. just looking mm. to to dry up the runs for us uh, against Australia to keep India in the match. I think we got bowled out full by like 190 odd. And mm. we mm. ended up winning that match in the, in the fourth innings because we didn't let Australia get away on day two. So uh, yeah, that I think that was Umesh's peak as a test bowler. And mm-hmm. Hopefully, he can make it back there, but I don't see it happening anytime. Yeah, but he did bowl so. well in that uh, Ranji Trophy, uh, too, I mean, in the semi-finals and the finals. Uh, right? Correct. He, he had a decisive spell there. I think he picked up something like six wickets. Correct. And uh, he's been incredible he, for Vidharba, right? But yeah. every time you play him, like we played him in Australia in the Test match in Perth. And it's, oh, it's yeah. just a different, it's a different quality of international batsman. I suppose you can get away with it a little bit in domestic cricket, but... Um, yeah, may, maybe we digress. So, Umesh Yadav, no to, no to the World Cup squad. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's I mean, go. you have a very good point, I think, DJ, just to wrap that up. I think at that highest level, even one bad ball will go to the boundary. And that's a killer in tests, right? In each over. Mm. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, going further, if we were to look at some of the pivotal matches for India, um, maybe we shouldn't be going into it World Cup by World Cup. But uh, let's start at that, uh, you know, the seminal moment for Indian short format cricket, the final of the 1983 World Cup. Uh, guys, uh, both of you have seen the highlights or were any of you even around to watch it? I don't know. What What are your thoughts on that? DJ, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, it was two years before I was born. Uh, oh. But it is the moment that everything changed, right? There's a great article by Ayaz Mem on Crick Info. And mm-hmm. it's called The Summer It All Changed. Um, and it's, it came out on the 30th of October last year. Ah. And it is such a fantastic article because he he's he's a lawyer like me and he had mm. gone to England to cover the World Cup as a journalist. And back then it was a part time kind of profession. He was paying out of his own pocket as well. Uh-huh. And he was really close to all the players. And it wasn't the, the relationship between the media and the players wasn't as tense as it, it is now. Mm. And by the end of that tournament... For him, everything had changed. I mean, he'd given up the idea of going back to practice law and he became a full-time journalist and he's done very well out of it. And cricket changed forever in in India. I mean, hockey was no longer the game that it needed to be and India was the superpower. Uh, the in, India was the, the India won the World Cup and everybody mm-hmm. suddenly knew who couples devils were and the next World Cup was held in India. It was the Reliance Cup. It, was, it had this final in Eden Gardens. Mm-hmm. And... The next World Cup after that, you had commercialization and liberalization of the Indian economy catching up with it. And then big money came into cricket. But without that 1983 World Cup, there would be nothing because no one would know who... I, I, I almost want to say no one would have known who Madan Lal or Roger Binney would have been. I mean, they would have been good, good test cricketers. But would they be superstars? And would we have watched them, watched their highlights over and over again and known how... Jimmy Amarna just ambled up and took that last wicket and then just ran off with that wicket. It's imprinted yes, yes, in everyone's yes. mind, right? Almost as mm. much as that last ball six from Dhoni is imprinted in everyone's mind. So 1983, huge, huge, huge occasion, huge moment for Indian cricket. And I would encourage anyone uh, to go and read that article by Ars Memon on, on Cricket Info. It's called The Summer It All Changed. Lovely. Uh, that, that's a good resource as well for us to check out. I, I have not read this article, but I would very much love to. And, you know, in that World Cup, I think India played almost fearlessly. This was It was a team full of, you know, uh, there were superstars, of course. There was Sunil Gavaskar, there was um, Kapil Dev, and there was probably Dilip Vengsarkar. There were quite a few of these superstar players there. But also there were a lot of utility cricketers, Madan Lal, Roger Bini, Mohinder Amarnath, you know, who would, who would sort of... Um, fit the conditions well because they were playing in England. This is one of the things. The other thing is that um, I think probably the best match of that World Cup was not televised. Kapil's 175, right? In the match against uh, Zimbabwe where they were like 17 for 5 or some such, they were in really a lot of trouble. And um, I think Kapil 
probably played the innings of his life in any format that that at least i would think that and th- due to some um, journalist uh, strike it was never covered bbc strike and there are there are no videos of that match available for me that was probably an equally seminal sort of a match as far as indians are concerned or the indian team is concerned but definitely defending 183 and you know um that, that that's that's something else if i think all of the subcontinent more or less woke up to the fact of what limited overs cricket could be and how exciting it could be and then all this uh, the sharja tournaments were sort of coming through and all of these things happened right so yeah it, it it was really a seminal moment but if you were to look at the matches quickly um india batting first uh, lasted only 54.4 overs and they made 183 right and you had krishnamachari shrikanth who top scored with 38 and he was playing very sedately uh, scoring only at a strike rate of 67 which was not let's say his thing Kapil Dev made a rapid 15, Sandeep Patel 27, Amarnath 26, right? All of these people. And then I think I might have been wrong when I said, you know, earlier when there was also the Vang Sarkar, probably he was not yet in the team. You had Kirti Azad, another utility cricketer, Raja Binni, Madan Lal, Shayat Kirmani, and of course, Balwinder Singh Sandhu with the, you know, banana in swinger and so on and so on. So there were contributions also from the tail, some very crucial contributions that took India to 183. But given what West Indies were doing earlier in the tournament, um, they were expected to win, I think. So it was Andy Roberts taking three for 32, Joel Garna one for 24, Malcolm Marshall two for 24, and then Michael Holding two for 26, Larry Gomes two for 49, right? After this, when the Windies came out to bat, Uh, they were only chasing at i don't know some yeah hardly 3.35 3.4 and over and it all started with that uh, looping banana in swinger from balwinder singh sandhu which took out gordon greenish's stumps and gordon greenish and Des- desi hens they could have probably you know if they were 54 no loss or whatever even in 15 overs or something the match was finished but that was a big breakthrough and of course that seminal catch where kapil dev ran all, all the way back from square leg uh, to the boundary to take the catch of madan lal to dismiss vivek richards for 33 this was very important then equally important were binny's uh, wickets i think he took uh, clive lord out then madan lal between them they took the middle order out madan lal and binny they took the top and the middle order out then sandhu came back to dismiss faud bakas uh, once uh, bakas was out then you had a bit of tail there was always a bit of sting in this west indian tail right even though they were all big burly fast bowlers they could bat a bit so Jeff Dujon sort of made 25 and then Malcolm Marshall kept in company with an 18. So until Malcolm Marshall was out, they were still not out of it. But once Malcolm Marshall was out at 124, I think the Indian team started sensing that the victory was still possible. And then they wrapped up the West Indian tail and West Indies were all out for 140. If you were to quickly look at the bowling analysis, Kapil Dev took 1 for 21, Balwinder Sandhu 2 for 32, Madan Lal 3 for 31. and Roger Binney won for 23 but the man of the match was Mohinder Amarnath with uh, 3 for 12 in his bowling analysis and of course he also scored a very patient 26 at the top of the order so he was adjudged the man of the match in India won this match right uh, apart from these things any other special moments you can recollect DJ or Giri about this match um, what i can recollect is uh, Roger Binney Roger Binney being a very successful bowler in the world cup mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. if you look at the number of wickets he took i think he took 17 or 18 wickets exactly uh, and Good he point. was the leading wicket taker in the world cup of course he played eight matches i think he played uh, until the finals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but i think uh, you already mentioned this kapil dev taking that catch you know uh, mm. running from square leg where right. you know i think the guy from the boundary i don't know who was uh, fielding at the boundary he mm-hmm. could have taken that catch uh, in a much more simpler way because he was running towards the ball Mm-hmm. You know, instead of uh, you know the the ball the ball moving away from you and Kapil Dev took that iconic catch I think uh, that uh, is something we brought up on I think we saw these uh, while we were growing up on television mm-hmm. highlights mm-hmm. indeed and uh, that uh, you know um, I think it was also the main reason uh, uh, 1983 World Cup victory that uh, India became such a powerhouse uh, in World Cup in cricket in general I think from there on uh, mm-hmm. it has been you know uh, it has been only on the way up um, in terms right. of results as well as in terms of you know financial uh, um, you know uh, i don't know what to say but the financially they have become uh, humongous they are the giants right i mean uh, yeah 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 now it, it used to be the big two now it's yeah. the big three because of the financial clout of course yeah. right uh, dj anything to add here yeah so interestingly the odds were 66 is to 1 i think Against wow, in the India, final. Went on, against wow. India uh, before the tournament started. 
Ah, right. But right. I would I'll actually just point out that actually India beat the West Indies in the prelim stage as well. Ah, so I was wrong then. All right, all right. Go on. By I think they beat them by 30 odd runs in the prelim stage. So there was form for it, but I mean after being bowled out for 183 in in 60 in a 60 over game with King Viv, right? Mm-hmm. Who who would have thought that India is going to win? But my one of my other memories from the World Cup final is actually Kapil Dev lifting that trophy and Krishna Machari Srikanth, who apparently was an absolute character in the Indian yeah. team, just standing behind him smoking one cigarette after the other. So, <laughs> I mean, it it shows you how long ago this was that the cricketers like smoking a cigarette in full public view as well. So I thought that was. It, it just tells you how long ago this was. I mean, can you imagine uh, Virat Kohli or Rohit Sharma even smoking a cigarette now, mm, let, mm, let alone in public? So, of course, of course. So, yeah, that that's how far, far, far uh, long ago this was. And I thought it was just fantastic. I mean, incredible win for India. And Kapil's innings, it's just such a shame. It's lost. The footage mm. isn't, isn't there. But anyone who was ever there, and I think, again, this goes back to that article, says that it was an incredible innings, nine for four, and then 17 for five. Exactly. And this guy comes yeah. in and, and rescues India. And that is the reason why we made the finals, right? So but if, if, you, if you haven't uh, seen this, I think there was there is an episode of uh, Kapil Dev being interviewed by this uh, guy, um, you know, this comedian. Uh, I don't remember his name. Kapil uh, Sharma? Kapil oh. Sharma, yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. In that interview, uh, Kapil Dev recollects uh, this incident, you know, in a funny va- funny manner. That he wasn't ready. He had just bowled, and he, I mean, he, he was not ready. He was not padded up. And yeah. He kept, yeah. kept tumbling down, and then he he, he was cursing everybody who was coming back uh, to the dressing room, saying, mm-hmm. "You're not giving me enough time to prepare." So he, he recollects this in a funny way, but it, he also says uh, in that interview that uh, you know the the whole team had no hope, or they mm-hmm. they hadn't even think uh, thought that uh, they were capable of winning World Cup. So they went with the lowest of expectations. Uh, being an underdog, not, I mean, I think they were completely obscure. They were not even there. The mm. powerhouses were England and West Indies. So one of them would win in the end, like mm. West Indies won it on the, the previous two occasions. So India pulling off such a miracle uh, and showing to the world that, uh, you know, they are also capable of uh, toppling uh, such a world-beating West Indian team at their mm-hmm. peak, let us let us all remember. Uh, I think it's a tremendous achievement and a true testament to uh, their skills as well as, you know, gelling so well as a team, all the players. I think that was a real team effort there. You just, you just look at the scorecard and the final and then you will see it's a team effort. There's no single standout player. Indeed. Yes, that, that's a very good point as well. So, uh, if you were to go on, um, let's quickly look at the other important matches where sort of... You know, you talk of the 1996 World Cup, you talk about the semi-final miss in 1987 before that, where, you know, everybody was anticipating an India-Pakistan final in Kolkata, and unfortunately, both of them couldn't make the final. And then, you know, Australia took the cup, of course. And then you come to 1992, and it was not a very particularly successful World Cup as far as India was concerned. And, you know, um, they had a 2-5 records, a record in the let's say the tour, uh, sorry, the group stages, as a result, they could not make the final or even they could not make the qualifiers. Then you come to the 1996 World Cup. This was this was also in, in, in a very important way. By then, this corporate money had started pouring in and people were flocking to the stadiums to watch their, uh, you know, their favorite players play. And we can quickly cover the, you know, the seminal quarterfinal in Bangalore where India beat Pakistan. DJ, uh, I think I think you sort of uh, were mentioning this to us off air as well. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, it's the greatest moment in Indian cricket history, right? I mean, so Hill's off stump being taken <laughs> out by this gentle giant from Bangalore. I mean, Venkatesh <laughs> Prasad just, I mean, I don't think anything's ever going to beat that. Possibly. It, it's just the greatest moment ever. I mean, it's Prasad's home ground as well. And yeah, it just took the wind out of the Pakistani chase. I mean, they would, they would, they would have won that match easily. Mm, and mm, mm. Yeah, it was great. great. I mean, uh, considering this guy sometimes bowls lower than Afridi, you know, and mm. to see that, you know, a real West Indian fast bowler like dismissal where the stump is going tumbling over and over and, you know, that sort of brought, uh, there was a bit of uh, needle before that, I think. Mm. So, Hale may have hit him to the boundary and told him to fetch the ball or some such and following which uh, Prasad cleaned him out and uh, it, it was a fitting yeah. reply, of course, and all that, as you said, absolutely, it remains in our 
minds also what remains for me like, in my mind is how jadeja finished off the innings exactly i was going to say that as well yeah go on, yeah he go was on. he whacked uh, wakar yunis uh, out of the park you know the, those sixes uh, i still remember as a kid uh, you know trying to mimic that shot while we were playing outside in the field mm-hmm. <laughs> with uh, two feet sta- you know planted in the crease uh, just pl- waiting for the yorker or a full end mm-hmm. delivery and then uh, hoiking it over uh, long gone uh, that, that's amazing i think that it really uh, takes back uh, um uh, you know um so i mean it, it those things are simply you know unforgettable uh, and also uh, i think miandad in that match uh, exactly. was dismissed for 38 runs mm-hmm. he also happened to be 38 years old that's how i remember mm-hmm. that's when he retired that was his last match um and yeah i think it was an amazing uh, moment in world cup history india winning against pakistan in home conditions in india of course but uh, yeah and then i i think pakistan have never beaten india uh, in the world cup uh, so far um, in the 50, 50 over world, world cup, cup 50 over world cup yes yes absolutely so no you are absolutely right if you if you get hold of the right kind of a conspiracy theorist he'll still convince you uh, a pakistani fan that is that jawad mian that um, let's say had some other motives to bat so slowly because i think mian that took more than 100 balls scoring his 38 and uh, Now that also contributed to Pakistan really not being able to chase the total down, a very large total down, right? Anyway, that that was a semi-final moment, but then what followed was an absolute disaster because in uh, Eden Gardens, the semi-final where you know India were playing Sri Lanka, and in spite of losing, you know, both their openers in the very first over, I think in one of our previous episodes or one of our guests, I think it might have been Nakul who encapsulated it when he said. the way sri lanka came back to take this match uh, uh, remains like one of the greatest world cup comeback wins as well that they lost both jaisuriya and kalwitharna in the very first over to shrinath and then they were able to post a very competitive total you know they made 251 but then you know india were going really strong with tendulkar taking them to 98 for one but then with tendulkar getting out suddenly the spinners started closing in sri lankan spinners and then india were 120 for eight in no time and then you have this really ugly scenes where the crowd from eden garden starts uh, you know throwing things into the ground and what not dj do you remember this one as well i wish i didn't remember this one i, <laughs> I, I was 11 years old i think and i'd come back from school because it wasn't a work working day and i had my my school hours finished at about 4 so i came back from school to see they were one for two so i'd missed the first over right right and then i remember arvinda got a 50 mahanama was carried off the field i think with cramps oh, after okay. getting 50 odd mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then you know as you did as a kid you had a shower and stuff and you got set to watch the second innings then dulkar was going to bat and you got set to watch the second innings on your 14 inch uh, onida tv right pretty much yeah all right yeah. I, I and know. sachin was batting beautifully i think manjrekar may have been with him mm-hmm. i think yes. he lost one yes. wicket early manjrekar with his white helmet was uh, exactly was yeah. there with him <laughs> and i think i still remember how where, where i was sitting in in the living room where when that moment happened the kalu with harana run out right, right and right. tony greg is on commentary and uh-huh. the ball just hits tendulkar's pad and and trickles behind the wicket and he takes off thinking there's a there's a leg by there and kalu has the bails off and tony greg is is going mad and he says i think he's in trouble here i think he's in trouble here and like all of india is just praying right that right, such right. is an out and i mean he was out and we know that he was out but that I, i'm talking about it now and i'm getting emotional it's almost like that moment in a few years later in chennai it's exactly the right. same feeling oh, that, that test match had. against oh god yeah yes, so yes. I, you you wish it turns out different every time but it doesn't <laughs> Yeah, yeah yeah um and then i mean we just collapsed azuruddin i think there was someone bowled around his ne- legs azuruddin popped a catch back to the bowler mm-hmm. calmly cried it was like it was pretty depressing i, I don't yeah, think i even watched the the final after that mm-hmm. it was just too depressing to watch cricket for a little while Wow. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you brought it back all all of it back. I mean, some of those some of those events you mentioned are like absolutely the stuff of uh nightmares if you're an indian cricket fan isn't it that 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 tendulkar uh, run out that tendulkar dismissal in the chennai test good god all right i i think we'll shake ourselves out of the stupor quickly so <laughs> that means uh, we'll go we'll quickly brush past the 1999 world cup not a lot to talk there right 
Um, then we can uh, go... Apart from the Tendulkar 100 after his dad passed, that was, oh, I thought that was special, man. All right, yes, yes. Incredible. I mean, and the way he signaled after he hit the 100, I remember. Yeah. That was, that was really something. For so a 26-year-old, right? Yeah, hmm. Kenya, 144, I think, but incredible. I mean, Absolutely. for a 26-year-old flying back after his father's funeral, incredible. So, yeah. hats off. Indeed. Now, I mean, we always say that, right? Nobody... Nobody can carry the load this guy carried. This young man carried for over a decade on his shoulders, right? I mean, that's quite something. I uh, think talking can... about sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Talking about '99 World Cup, we have to mention Rahul Dravid. Mm-hmm. He was the agree, you know, highest aggregate run scorer. Mm. He scored 527 runs, if my memory serves me right. Right. Uh, and he had that amazing partnership with uh, Saurav Ganguly. Uh, ah, Taunton. Taunton. Yeah. Yes. Into into the river. And I think. Uh, Dravid scored 149 or 153, and he was then a wicketkeeper batsman. So, right. Right. <laughs> um, right. so it was an amazing match. Sri Lanka were uh, basically taken uh, for uh, yeah. Uh, so they were uh, they were all over the place. I, I remember Saurav Ganguly dancing down the wicket and uh, whacking Murli Zaran all the way uh, to the mid wicket boundary for a couple of sixes. In fact, out of the stadium. So, um, right, right. So I, I mean, I. I think I only uh, I, I was probably at uh, at college. Uh, I just came back home from uh, mm. from my college, right. and I just saw these two guys were batting, so we, and uh, I think I caught the right moment there. So they, it was Perfect. an amazing match. I think three, uh, Sri Lanka were, I think India were India scored something like 370 runs at that time. That must have been the highest total mm. uh, in a World Cup match, uh, mm. and uh, yeah. They, they 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 had no fight left yeah, in them Sri Lanka. They were completely uh, you know uh, downbeat after that. No, it was a very very large total as well. Also, yeah. there was a bit of needle. I remember it was just shortly around the Kar- Kargil conflict was between India Pakistan batting mm. the match, right? So anyway, so uh, th- there were some uh, let's say memorable moments. But as far as India were concerned, they only finished sixth. They just made made it to the Super Six, but nothing more. Yeah. But right. they beat Pakistan along the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. That and was Vintage there. Prasad yeah. picked up five wickets, if I'm not wrong. Absolutely. That match. Correct. And, and Jadeja uh, tripped over the rope after taking the last catch. <laughs> That's <laughs> the other thing I remember. Yeah. Right. Because they, they would bring the ropes in, right? And back, ah. back then in England, you uh, you didn't have fences. So they, they would bring the ropes in. So the players would run off. And the stewards started bringing the rope in the moment Jadeja took the catch. And he turned around <laughs> and fell over the rope. <laughs> that's 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 a bit too preemptive. I mean, no large uh, presentation ceremonies, no cutouts and such, such. But okay, that was a different time, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Oh, they were they were like really they they were sure he was going to catch it. They were already bringing it in, but sure, sure, it worked, whatever, right? So going further, uh, if we were to quickly then step over to the 2003 Cricket World Cup, where you know India were doing good. You know, if you were to look at their performances, I mean, they had won nine matches and they only lost two matches in the tournament. And Australia had a 11 nil record, of course. And both India's losses, if I'm not wrong, were to Australia in that tournament. And the second one was the final, where, you know, the Indian team was speaking nicely up until that point where the bowlers were performing well, Naira taking that 6-4, right? And basically, Srinath sort of reinventing himself, starting to bowl slower, um, let's say some slower balls and basically reinventing himself as a more successful one day bowler let's say right so dj uh, what are your thoughts on the 2003 world cup maybe some memories special memories for you um yeah so this is during my class 12 um again during just i think after my pre boards and before my boards and during my boards in fact so again i remember this very very clearly um, India started its campaign poorly, from what I remember. It lost to Australia. I think we got bowled out mm. for 125. And mm-hmm. then there were people were burning things. And uh, I think Kef's house got attacked. I think Kef's Standard, house Standard. got attacked. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. And then after that, we kind of picked ourselves up. Um, we started beating lots of teams. We're doing, we started doing really well. Uh, we beat Pakistan at Centurion, which was an amazing, amazing... Uh, it was just... Fantastic. We had that mm-hmm. Nehra 6 4 against England. Yeah. But that, yeah. that Pakistan game where Sachin scored 98, I think, of 75, and just, uh, I mean, those first two overs and, and yeah. the batting in those two first overs, just amazing batting. And I don't think anyone who's ever watched that will ever forget Sachin batting against Shoaib and, and Wasim mm-hmm. and Wakar in, in that match. Those uppercuts, right? 
Yeah, yeah the uppercuts, the straight drive, the flick. I mean, it was all there in that one over, right? In the second over, I think, of Shoaib, where such an... Shoaib Akhtar, uh, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Uh, amazing batting. Yeah. And it was the emergence of Mohammad Kef and um, Yuvraj Singh as, as finishers, and Dravid as a finisher as well, because he was batting lower down the order, and he was playing the finisher role uh, and, mm-hmm. and the keeper role together. So it was very interesting to see Dravid do that, the ultimate team man, after being the top run scorer in the previous World Cup, he dropped himself down the order to for the uh, great greater good of the team, and it worked very well. Dinesh Mungia was a bit of a passenger, if I remember correctly, and people were questioning why he's in the team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All the way to the final. Now, we had a slightly easier route to the final, I think, because we played Kenya twice, and Ganguly scored 200 exactly. against them, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> Okay, okay. And then the final, and this is one of the memories that me and my co-podcaster Varun, the one who doesn't, not the one who follows Umesh, but the other one, <laughs> we have very clearly, because we watched that uh, final match together, it was between, I think, our maths and English exams, so we both had those subjects, so um, oh. we were watching that match together at his place, and when the coin came down, we still remember how Ganguly said with that confidence, we'll have a bowl. And all of us were just like, why would you bowl in a World Cup final? And then we saw the first over and Zaheer Khan comes in and he bowls a a, a, a kind of bouncing, seeming delivery which moves away and it's a no ball. And then everyone's like really pumped about it. And then the first over, I think, went for mm. 10 or 15 runs. And yeah, from yeah, there, yeah. it was just downhill, yeah. right? We had one glimmer of hope where Sevag was smashing and it was about to rain. So we were on par with the duck with Lewis. But, I mean, it was disappointing to lose that match. But again, I mean, I, I don't think India could have beaten an Australian team at its absolute peak then. And Australia was at its peak. And we probably didn't win, deserve to win that World Cup. 360 was probably a bridge too far at that stage. So fair result, but disappointing for Indian fans. Mm. Nah, you're absolutely right. I think that also sealed the fate for uh, Jawagal Srinath. He had a horrible match. I think he went for a lot of runs. Must have been 70 or 80 runs in his uh, 10 overs. Exactly. Uh, so it yeah, Ponting was off. playing him like a spinner, right? He was just hitting exactly. him for six with one hand. So it was pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. And Damien Martin, I think those two guys basically took the game away from India. Um, Damien Martin and... Uh, yeah, and Martin didn't score 100, if I remember correctly. Again, maybe I should look at the score, score card. Yeah, so he, he, got, he, he got 80, 80 or something. 80, 80. Okay. yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, you are probably right, DJ, that, you know, India didn't deserve to win. Maybe those Australian teams, they were real, real champions, a pedigree team, right? And as you say, Zaheer Khan had certain ideas that he wanted to take Hayden out, uh, Kilkist out, and Hayden was so calm. I remember they took ten runs off, doing not a lot, and finally you saw that this team was at a different level, mind mentally as well as in terms of their preparation. I think the Australian team was at a completely different level, and yeah, I mean this basically routed the Indian team, and yeah, Seva was doing enough. Let's say in the first 15, 18 hours, even 20 hours, but it was a bridge too far. You're absolutely right. So, you know. At the end of the day, um, yeah, I think uh, they just ran into a really better team. That's all. This Indian team was not too bad by itself, but maybe not really World Cup winning quality. This brings us, well, let's quietly skip over 2007. I don't want to recall much of it unless somebody has any specific thoughts. Guys? Was there a World Cup in 2007? That's the sort of <laughs> Exactly. Okay. All right. All right. Then when we go away, uh, we go into the glory that is 2011. So no, it's just one one thing I wanted to mention, uh, mm-hmm. 2007 World Cup. Uh, well, I was disappointed that uh, India, you know, India were knocked out. Right. But I was then a little bit, uh, you know, don't call me sadist, but uh, I was also a little bit relieved that Pakistan had also missed out. So it was kind <laughs> of, <laughs> so it, it was a kind of relief that both uh, big subcontinent teams had missed out. Uh, but, uh, well, yeah. probably you are one of the few people who are happy. I'm sure the tournament organizers or the sponsors were not. But I mean, mm-hmm. that's 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 how things go. I'm sure. Yeah, that that was the reason. Ever since India and Pakistan have always played each other in a World Cup game at least once or a Champions Trophy game at least mm-hmm. once, they make sure that the format works so that India Pakistan happens. Yeah. Because that was one of the World Cups that didn't happen. Right? It was meant <laughs> to happen in the next stage, but. I think it was Ireland and Bangladesh, right? That played. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. All right then. I mean, for me, the um, the highlight of the match was uh, you know the Bermuda player uh, Wayne Leverock, if you remember, diving yeah. 
taking a catch at slipper gully it was and the whole stadium shaking or whatever right so for me that was the only thing i remember from the world cup the rest has just faded away from my memory 400 odd runs india scored in that match yes, yes i think yeah and that dwayne levro catch is robin uttapa's greatest contribution to international <laughs> cricket so not even not even the 2007 uh, super you know, over yeah that one or maybe even the you know the 2007 uh, t20 world cup win maybe no, not not oh, that that was pretty good actually to to be fair yeah okay maybe i misspoke Ro- robin yes. atapa was pretty good when he went uh, also the bowl out right he got right, right exactly he, he yeah, just bowl out, yeah. the bowl out so mm-hmm. yeah. good celebration also so okay robin maybe, maybe you redeemed yourself all no, right no, no. i'm sure he's happy so going further now at the 2011 world cup right so i think um, i mean india were let's say playing at home of course and um they they won seven matches and lost only one and they have been uh, they were also sort of the pre tournament favorites this is one of the tournaments it was against subcontinent and of course subcontinent teams were hyped but uh, again if you just go through the tournament let's rather than going through the match uh, match by match sort of if you we were to concentrate on the couple of uh, you know the last two matches the semi final versus pakistan and the finals guys uh, your thoughts maybe the pakistan semi final to begin with lot of nerves lot of nerves you saw it in the little masters innings i think he scored 85 right. and he he got mm-hmm. dropped like four times afridi dropped him there was that drs review which uh-huh. still looks dodgy till now of ajmal yes um, yes it it just seemed like there was a lot of nerves and india just managed their nerves better than pakistan somehow and pakistan i remember got off to a very good good start chasing 260 odd but Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um i think they just couldn't deal with the pressure of i don't know the prime ministers were there there was a world exactly. cup final spot in in contention mm-hmm. um india just held themselves together better exactly. at mohali and i mean all credit to ms dhoni of course i mean um, speaking of the semi final just to wrap up i mean you don't even need to find a conspiracy theory of a certain kind any you can pick any pakistan cricket fan and he'll tell you tendulkar was out that day right and you are absolutely right when you look at the replay it's more than 50% uh, should have been given out let's say let me put it like that yeah so uh, that but you are absolutely right if you look at the rest of the match i think the indians came out on top because they were able to keep uh, keep hold of their nerves it was so it was such a high pressure environment good god and i mean i don't want to jump the gun but one feels in 2019 when india meet uh, india meet pakistan again it'll be a similar sort of uh, environment right so uh, coming back to the 2011 so then it was the final where india were playing sri lanka whom i think they played about twice a year almost every year so uh, they were well aware of each other's strengths and weaknesses but i think mahela jayawardena played a very special innings in the final to score 100 to begin with right and then uh, they had a reasonable total 260 was not a very easy target given that it was the final and they had runs on the board etc and then i think i remember you know india losing sahwag early uh, oh i'm told it's 274 actually i'm sorry so um, in this case um, well uh, lasit malinga got into the act and sahwag and sachin were both dismissed dismissed very early and india was india was 31 for 2 in the seventh over right but gambhir chose to dig in and drop anchor so to say and he was really unlucky to miss a 100 there right and then he first of all rebuilt the innings really well with kohli and then once kohli was out the, the run rate was still up against them but dhoni walked in he promoted himself above the man of the tournament yuvraj singh and they hit 109 for the fourth wicket in even time but then uh, when by the time gambhir was out he was sort of very tired he looked like when he got out but yuvraj joined dhoni and they sort of took over and they finished the match and dhoni hit the winning six right uh, dj i mean uh, what are your thoughts any special memories of this match So as as I was saying after the Mohali game I got a call from one of my friends who said he'd managed to get himself a ticket to the World Cup final in Good Mumbai. God. Good God. And he said he had a spare ticket. So did I want to fly down to India for it? And I said, "Well, there's a direct flight to Mumbai from London." Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The semi-final had taken place on Thursday. So uh-huh. Friday morning I flew out and um on set, we got there for saturday and uh, mm-hmm. yeah there was a ticket waiting for us and in the garware pavilion and 
Sachin's homecoming. I have uh-huh. to say that Mahela's innings was incredible. It was beautiful. Like, you don't even notice he'd got a hundred almost till he was on. He was past a hundred because he was silken and amazing, amazing touch play and fantastic batting. Mm-hmm. And it was all under control until um, I think it was Pereira, Tisara Pereira came in and just mm-hmm. started swinging right. and right. got a few sixes away. Mm-hmm. And then Sachin hit that straight drive and a cut shot. And I have to say, like that moment where he got out to Malinga, yeah. caught by Sangakara, there was mm-hmm. pin drop silence in the one kid. It was, it was like. I mean, nothing like you've ever felt before. It was like something had, like, basically Thanos had snapped his fingers and half of humanity had died. And that's mm-hmm. that's what it was like until everybody got up and gave Sachin the the applause. And then Kohli came in and, and got, I think, got 35 and he batted lovely, nicely and then got out to a good catch by Dilshan. Right. And then, to our surprise, MS Dhoni walks in, right? And him and Gambhir go on together. And Dhoni is just... I mean, I'm a huge Dhoni fan. So, if anyone's mm-hmm. listened to the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast, they know that I'm I'm Dhoni through and through from... It doesn't matter how bad he's doing. I, I, I love the guy because, I mean, the guts it takes to come out in mm-hmm. a World Cup final at home right. when you haven't been in the best of form above the man of the tournament is just i mean it's mind blowing and maybe there's a logic to keeping a left hand right hand combination right because gambhir was still there i think when uh, kohli got out so that's why Tony walks yeah. in so maybe that was the logic of it but the self confidence and the bravery that it takes and the courage it takes from somebody to to say i'm going to do the job from here on and to mm. do it mm. I don't think right. we're ever going to see a player like MS Dhoni again. And I'm not talking about his amazing wicket-keeping skills or his batting skills or his strategic skills. Just the complete package. Where are we ever going to find this person again? He's won everything that there is to win. He's brought the World Cup back home. Mm-hmm. He's brought the Champions Trophy home. He's won the IPL. He's won the T20 World Cup. He's taken India to number one in the world in, in, the world in test matches. There's nothing left for him to do. And I mean, mm-hmm. I that was mind-boggling. That innings of 91, you say Gambhir was unlucky to get out. Dhoni was absolutely mm-hmm. right. I mean, why did he throw his wicket away in 97? I, I, I thought that Dhoni did, did deserve the man of the match. He made 91 in a winning cause, not out. Hitting the winning six. Of course. Which, mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's been lasered into every Indian's brain, right? Dhoni finishing it off in style. So, mm, mm. absolutely magnificent. I, great, One of the greatest nights of my life. The marine drive and everything was incredible. Everybody was out dancing in, in the streets. There were people dancing on top of my taxi when I was trying to go back home. But uh, nobody minded <laughs> because, I mean, India had won the World Cup. It, it hadn't happened in our lifetime before. So, I think I'm getting a bit wow. emotional. So, I'm going to hand over to someone else. <laughs> no, I think it's man, even better uh, than you, catching you, a... Haley's Comet, right? It's it that that passes every 75 years. We're pretty yeah. much. Uh, I think it's it's a privilege. It's very nice to hear your uh, your about your first-hand experience uh, from the Wankhede. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, even I feel the ghost goosebumps. You know the way you exactly. tell it. Fantastic, fantastic to hear. All right. I mean, going on. I mean, maybe you've also made some plans for this World Cup because after all, you're based out of UK, I think. So we can get to that shortly, right? So going further. That was a, that was a fantastic win for India, and again, I think uh, the cricket world again realized it was not just the corporate money, it was not just the IPL, it was not any of all of these things, right? But India were uh, truly the superpower in the cricketing world now. Right? You are absolutely right when it comes to Dhoni. He he's, he's pretty much you know people sometimes compare him to Michael Jordan or Michael Schumacher, one of these people who are really who won everything there is to win, so to say, right? I mean, in a, in another podcast somewhere in another language, I heard somebody compare him to Alexander of cricket. It's it's a bit of a hype, but maybe it's not, you know. It's Wait, which when, podcast is this? It's a Kannada podcast called Cricket Kannadiga. Oh, uh, is it run by Alok? Uh, yes, yes. Who was your super fan? RCB super fan. Yes. And okay. we went to law school together. Alok and I went to law school together. So definitely great podcast. And he does the a political podcast also called Gantantra. So ah, amazing. This I've not heard. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Yeah, Alok's All a great right. guy as well. So you should you should definitely have him on the show. Much more knowledgeable than me. All right, good to know. And uh, shout out to Alok if you're listening to this one, right? All right, going further. We quickly switch over to the 2015 World Cup where, you know, India were again doing wonderfully well until, they, well, they ran into Australia in the semi-final and that's their only defeat, right? So, uh, DJ, quick thoughts? Yeah, so this is a funny World Cup for me. We won everything mm-hmm. and we lost one match and all hell broke loose uh, because we lost to the uh, to Australia in the semi-finals. Kohli didn't score on, so he got abused. His Girlfriend at the time, Anushka Sharma, got abused. Now his wife. So, mm, mm, mm. Um, uh, And we wrote an article on a blog. Back then, we didn't have a podcast. We had a blog called onetip1hand.com. And we wrote an article saying no one has a lean on winning. And basically, yeah. the Indian fan had just got so used to winning everything that it just the expectation was to win. So from 1983 that we were talking about, about previously, where you were 66 to 1 odds against you, Mm. You'd come to a position where the Indian fan demanded victory more than in anything else. So I found that utterly, the, the behavior that came out from the Indian fan after that loss was, it was shocking. I mean, and we saw a little mm. bit of that after we lost to South Africa in 2011, where people went after Nehra on social media. Right, but right. the backlash that the Indian cricketers got after the 2015 defeat that left a really bad taste in my mouth and that is my that's actually my overarching memory of 2015 sadly enough it's it's not about the cricket it's it's not about Rohit Sharma batting really well in the right. quarterfinals it's not Kohli scoring 100 <laughs> against Pakistan it's not winning every, six out of six it's mm, it's that mm. one loss which people just lost their minds over and I, I found that I found that the Indian fan had changed from someone yeah. who watched cricket in the 90s and was surprised when India won, right? Like, mm, that, mm. that's how I grew up. Where India won, great, well well done. To somebody right. who said, we demand victory. And if we if you lose, you need to explain yourself to us. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. I mean, that entitlement is never a good thing. I mean, as, as much as we all love cricket, you have to understand it's a game and sometimes people win, sometimes they lose, right? And well, I mean, they had really played well and they were going, you know, they were more or less, you know, on track to take uh, the title again and defend their own title. But it was, it was unfortunate. Well, just go back to that uh, quarterfinal, I think, that uh, Rohit Sharma innings. You remember what happened when he was on 90, the full toss that Rubel Hussain bowled? DJ? Yeah, yeah, the uh, contentious full toss. I mean, mm-hmm. neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. I, I still don't think he was a... He was a Full toss. So mm. I, I don't think it was a no ball actually that full toss. But yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. Bangladesh lost, right? So the fans aren't happy either. So right. What what can you do? Well, what? I mean, the standard thing happened. They burned uh, Alim Dar's effigy, and I think um, even the Prime Minister of uh, Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, at that point in time, uh, had something to say about it. But uh, the most uh, extreme reaction I remember was Mustafa Kamal who was then the ICC president quitting his post in a half I mean yeah that was a bit of a you know a bit of a visceral of a more of a gut reaction but still it was unexpected I think but yeah I mean going for going further look in the semi-final Australia did make 328 right and that that was a tall total and uh, it was almost what happened in 2003 sort of again when India ran into Australia in one of the knockout matches and Australia batting first made such a tall total that it was not going to be easy especially given that they were playing at home and whatnot. So it was not going to be easy at all. And of course, they won comfortably. And uh, I remember also, I think Dhawan may have played a reasonable innings, a 45 or some such, right? And then Rahane and Dhoni took a bit of time. Rahane was, I think, criticized for it as well. He made 44 or 68 balls. Dhoni did his bit, but then there was nobody after that at all. And then, um, you know, 233 all out India where they lost comfortably, right? So... It, it was okay. That can happen. Uh, but yeah, now I think we have now reached the stage where I think we'll quickly take a look at uh, the squad, right? So uh, taking a quick look at the squad, um, for, let's start with you, DJ. I mean, um, uh, what are the talking points for you in the squad, really? Or is this sort of unexpected lines for you? So I think when the squad actually came out, we were about halfway through the IPL. So it was on expected lines then. 
right? And the squads come out uh, three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Since then, the, the talking point for the last two years on our podcast has been the number four slot. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it, it it has been on many other podcasts that look at Indian cricket. Right. And Vijay Shankar seemed to have done enough, mm-hmm. but he's been out of form for the Sunrisers Hyderabad. He he looks he looks okay, but he just hasn't scored runs. And so there's a little bit of a question mark over that number four slot again. Is it going to be Rahul? Is it going to be Shankar? Is it going to be Pan? I don't know because you still got till the 23rd of May to finalize mm, your squad, mm. right? And Kedar Jadav has got his, got an injury. Mm, mm, mm. So for me, that is a bit of a a, a worry. And mm. the form of the spinner Kuldeep Yadav, right? Plus right, of the form of Bhuvaneshwar, those are the worries for me. All good points. Let's quickly dissect each one of them. So, to begin with, first of all, the point of whether who will bat at four, right? Considering that uh, KL Rahul has made a successful comeback into the 15, so to say, and uh, to the top flight cricket, I would expect he would start at four, right? I mean, Vijay Shankar has done enough for sure, but as the chief selector said, he's a 3D cricketer. And uh, maybe against a moving ball, a more traditionally equipped, somebody who's more test match like somebody like KL Rahul is probably better equipped to play uh, a moving ball. You could be, you know, 10 for 2 or you could be 8 for 2 in England. You, all India's matches, let's not forget, are morning starts, right? So uh, maybe, you know, one of the opposition wins the toss and inserts India in and you have two new balls and, you know, it can like, happen in England. And I would say maybe I would expect Rahul to start off in that slot but maybe there will be some more um, you know they say the top three are the only three positions fixed the rest will be sort of more of a musical chairs right so Shankar will get a go at some point in time but considering we also will probably have a Pandya who's red hot in the 11 maybe and we'll have three other fast bowlers is what I hope to start they'll start with and um, I, I would expect that given this I think Rahul will start this is my opinion this is the first thing second thing maybe I also feel Ambati Raidu may have been a bit a bit unfortunate, but I thought his his form was also on the wane, and his and his records in England does not do him any favor whatsoever, right? So, DJ, any thoughts on that, Ambati Raidu? So, Ambati Raidu, I think the issue with him, and it's something again that we spoke about when the squad came out on our pod with the other guys, is he failed his fitness test after the IPL last year, right? And that's why he missed the bus yeah. to England. Or the, right. missed the plane to England, mm-hmm. and that really went against him. Um, he's a class player. He's always been one of the people that people have picked out from an early age to do well. Right. But fitness hasn't been great for him. He's got a good average in one-day cricket. I think he averages about 47 or something yeah, like that. I think that. it was even 50 plus until very recently. Absolutely. Yeah. So so he averages 47 at the moment, I think. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's. It's unlucky for him, but age isn't on his side, unlike Vijay mm-hmm. Shankar. And Vijay Shankar has done well in the recent past in New Zealand in innings. He's played innings against the moving ball, which Absolutely. I think have gone in his favor, right? So all this talk about 3D cricketers and all of that is good. But I mean, Shankar has bowled, I think, one important over in, in his career. <laughs> right? Okay. And that, that was the last over. And that's, I think that's once in a blue moon. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I think Shankar, for me, starts at four, barring any surprises with Kedar. Assuming Kedar is fit, Mm. I think Shankar will will start at four. If Kedar isn't fit, I think Mm. Shankar will take his spot and we'll probably have Rahul, I think, bat at at four. You know, just, just to go a bit more there, if Kedar were to not be able to make the World Cup, you're saying Pant would be in the squad? So, I have a so Pant, different opinion. Pant has scored 450 runs this IPL, right? He's he has. got three fifties and Absolutely. he averages 30 odd this IPL. I mean, it's as good as record as anybody else. He's batted at four for Delhi. He's moved down mm. one slot from last year where he was the tournament purple cap holder, batting right. at three, smashing uh-huh. everyone all over the place. And he's a top order batsman and he's starting to show that maturity, right? So now... To my mind, Rishabh Pant is not a finisher. And yeah, he's yeah. being asked to play that role in T20 cricket, batting at four in T20 cricket. I mean, you'd, you'd be there more often than not in the 12th over. 
yeah and expected to see the team home that's not that's not what he's done from the start of his career he's he's opened the batting he's batted at 3 at under 19 level he's batted at he's opened the batting mm. so he's not somebody who's there at the end of the innings he's somebody who takes advantage of the field restriction that goes over the top right. so i would say bat him at 4 even if you're 8 for 2 He mm-hmm. plays natural game, and that's not. I mean, whether you're eight for two or you're twelve for four, twelve for three, what's the difference? Well, I mean, okay, I have I have a counterpoint for this. Yeah. If Jada were to not make the World Cup, you need a batsman who can bat a bit lower in the order, come in around thirty fifth, forty eighth over, and take India to a very competitive total, right? And who can also provide you a few more overs of spin, you know. Uh, I would throw a name uh, just out of the blue and from the left field. I would say, how about Krunal Pandya? You also have Jadeja, who's a like for like, but Krunal Pandya has been performing a similar sort of a role for Mumbai. I don't know if the selectors also think of similar terms for me. Somebody like Pant is very good and he's very exciting and he could actually very very well go in uh, near the top of the innings. rather than going near the end he would probably not be uh, going after dhoni but krunal pandya can do that and of course he can always give you five to eight overs of spin right with which also sort of jadav does for kohli so how what do you think about this dj correct so i think it's it's an interesting idea but krunal hasn't played a single one day match i think we talked about this on our pod mm. last year where i i actually suggested why don't we get krunal pandya in and the other two guys were like if we wanted to get him in we would have got him in by now but he's a t20 specialist i don't think he's played a one day game and i'm happy to be corrected if i'm wrong but i don't think he no, has he we, we were looking at him as a like for like for jadeja exactly but yeah, jadeja is yeah. in right so i mean if yeah, you got jadeja yeah. in the squad why krunal pandya equally you could say nitish rana he spins the he bowls off spin and bats pretty well but exactly i mean you already have jadeja in the squad so i don't think replacing hmm. jadav with krunal pandya will work especially since he hasn't been put on standby by, by the selectors right so there's a yeah, bunch of yeah. uh, there's raidu there's saini and there's rishabh pant who've been asked to stay on standby so it'll be um, one of those three if and and that's a big if if Uh, Jadav is injured, and at the moment, the the uh, news I think is that he isn't. But we'll have to wait and watch how right. that develops. I mean, they want to keep his spot safe, is what the, what I read recently on Cricket Info. So basically, it means they would like to secure that spot for him, hoping that he'll make it in time, even if after one or two matches he'll be there. Right? They see his value for the team, right? As a finisher as well as like a couple of hours of whatever we call it. Gold and all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some uh, guerrilla cricket calls it right arm filth. So whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So one of my one of my co-podcasters, Varun, he he's uh, he's not a fan of Kedar at all. He uh, so whenever on Edges and Sledges we talk about Kedar, we call him the greatest all-rounder after Kapil Dev. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, come on. Yeah. So come the on. the other two of us keep ribbing Varun about uh, about Kedar Jada when how, how what a great all-rounder he is. Hmm. 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 All right, all right. Uh, I mean, better than people like Lakshmi Ratan Shukla, you know, all of those people. Joe Kinder Sharma, come on, come on. All right. All yeah, Vijay right. Vijay so, Bharadwaj, all of these. Vijay Bharadwaj as well, right? Come on. All right. Uh, let's let's move on. But okay, I think I I sort of agree with you that probably Pant. I don't know if Ambati Raidu will be chosen, but you never know because you have to keep us already in the squad. And of course, Ambati Raidu is also not a finisher for sure. He's not. So that that's an interesting topic that in itself can be expanded a bit. but let's really hope you know jadav makes the squad otherwise the balance of the squad might be a bit different than what kohli would want i think right going further uh, the other point you sort of mentioned as a flash point for you was the form of uh, kuldeep yadav i think he famously had a breakdown in one of the ipl matches when he was whacked around and right and uh, i think uh, his form went from bad to worse uh, that happened and of course also bhuvi bhuvi's form was not great in the last few matches while playing for srh right so but i think they are already in the squad first of all and then i think this this x factor that kuldeep brings is still very valued by this team right let's start there um do you think they'll take a risk of replacing him maybe because with another risk, risk spinner maybe somebody like uh, another left field pick rahul chahar or shreyas gopal do you think so i think 
they won't replace him because I think that will absolutely destroy his confidence. He had he had a bad run with KKR and uh, sat out the last few matches. And I'm sure he's done work in the nets. And bowling for India with Dhoni behind the stumps and Kohli by his side and Rohit advising him, I think it's a different different feeling altogether yeah. where he, he feels more loved. Uh, Karthik is a different kind of captain, I mm-hmm. think. Uh, Callis is a different kind of coach. So I think uh-huh. he'll get the support that he needs from the Indian setup. Right. Um, plus, having a left arm wrist spinner is a luxury, and there are not those many of them going around, right? So Absolutely. you can see you, the names you gave are both right hand, and we already have Yuzvendra Chahal. So mm. uh, I don't see him being replaced. But if there's an injury, I, I can see either Gopal or uh, Chahal being brought in. I think Gopal would probably be the front runner in that case, Absolutely. given his amazing. IPL this year and he did pretty well last year as well plus he can bat yeah. he used to be a batsman yes 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 Indeed. so Indeed. so one to watch uh, for the future and and mm-hmm. good signs for him but uh, I think Kuldeep will definitely play okay. the, the World Cup uh, mm. Bhuvaneshwar on the other hand before the IPL I would have said he walks into the 11 mm. with because he adds that extra skill of batting and he's a good fielder Mm-hmm. After the IPL, mm, I think it's a call that will be taken given the conditions, whether it's going to be Shami or uh, Pobi to partner Bumra with the new ball. I think he's had a, he's had a poor IPL. Mm-hmm. And, and Shami's had a decent IPL. so And he's had a decent year, actually. Mohamed Shami Shami well, indeed. came to England last time. so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a call will be taken closer to the time, depending on whether you've got seeming conditions or where you need to hit the deck a little bit more. What I like is Shami can still bowl very effectively with a slightly older ball. That is your 38th, 40th over onwards, right? Where maybe, you know, Bhuneshwar Kumar used to be really good in those overs as well, uh, finishing it, finish, finishing off in ODI innings. That really depend on how well his confidence is recovered and whether he's also able to fulfill that role again for India. You definitely have Jaspreet uh, Bumrah taking one end, right? So who will finish it off with him? Will it be Shami or will it be Bhuneshwar Kumar? That's one thing. The other thing, I still sort of value his... Uh, I would not give those last overs to Hardik Pandya. I would still trust Bhuneshwar Kumar, even a half or a you know, three quarters confident Bhuneshwar Kumar is probably a bit more reliable than Hardik Pandya there. I don't know if you think that as well, DJ. So absolutely. Pandya will not bowl the end overs. Pandya will have to bowl in the middle uh, and probably mm. split his overs with uh, Kedar. Mm. If Kedar mm. is fit and can bowl, which right. is why I think right. the Indian team is keen to make sure that Kedar plays because depending on Hardik for full 10 overs is, I think it's again going to be difficult. Kedar will probably need to chip in with at least three or four or five overs even to split mm. the spell with right. Hardik. And mm. they kind of play, they bowl in the middle, fit around the spinners and the quicks come back and finish it off. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Then, I mean, this leaves, let's say, Yuzvendra Chahal. I mean, I don't know if, who, which of which of these two do you think will start? I mean, will it, will it be Yuzi Chahal starting or maybe Kuldeep Yadav will be given uh, a chance uh, to start off the World Cup? I think it will be Yuzi Chahal, but what do you think? So, again, I think depending on the conditions, if they are flat conditions, um, mm. I think two, we'll play two spinners. I think we'll play both Kuldeep as well as Chahal. And they've bowled very well when they've played together. So if you look uh-huh. at their stats, they actually do better when they play together. Right. Yeah. And you then, because otherwise the attack becomes very one dimension. It becomes, uh, you have three quicks plus Pandya plus one spinner and plus one part-time spinner. Whereas mm. with the two wrist spinners, you've got that variety. So unless there's a pitch that's going to be seeming a lot, mm-hmm. I see us playing two quicks, two spinners and the all-rounder in Pandya and the half all-rounder in Kedar. So that that would be the ideal combination for me. Um, mm-hmm. Unless you've got something that's seeming around corners and you've got the ball swinging around, in which case Shami will probably, again, to my mind, replace Yuzvendra Chahal because for better or for worse, Kuldeep mm-hmm. has that X factor of being a left-arm Chinaman and not too many players have, have played against him. Agreed. No, all, that is definitely, he can be a trump card, especially in a knockout situation as well, right? This guy could simply wrap his, uh, wrap an opposition team around his fingers, so to say. Yeah, and the, and the last time the World Cup was in England, there was another wrist spinner, a blonde guy called Shea yeah. who did pretty well, right? So, mm. uh, he rates Kuldeep Chahal as a good bowler, so 
I would I would play Ch- I, I would play play uh, Kuldeep Yadav instead of Chahal, even though mm-hmm. he hasn't had a great IPL. All right, all right. Ah, so that I mean that more or less leaves I think the top three they are settled. They are going in. Kohli did not look very comfortable, and Shikhar Dhawan has sort of rediscovered a bit of his form. But I think it's it's a long enough group stages that they'll be able to uh, discover that rhythm and that devastation that when it comes to chasing totals, right? I think that's that's going to be key for India. What do you think? Absolutely, and flexibility is going to be another key for India. Again, it's something that comes up again and again every week when we speak. Uh, if we're chasing and we've got a normal total to chase, say 240, 250, 270, even I think Dhoni comes in at four. Right. Easy. Right. Uh, if we need a bigger score, I think Dhoni probably comes in further down the order and you get someone who can keep the scoreboard ticking along, someone like Kedar or someone like Karthik or even maybe a Pandya to come up the order, depending on how the top three have done. Right. Mm. So if you're 240 for two chasing 340, that's not when you send Dhoni in. That's when you send a Pandya or a Karthik in mm-hmm. or a Kedar in who can keep the scoreboard ticking along and make sure you don't get stuck and then just leave Dhoni to finish off the end if needed, if required, that is. Agreed. Well, I mean, the only thing there is, uh, I would say maybe, uh, well, a couple of points. One is, I think they would also keep out uh, Karthik in such a situation because he can be used more like a bludgeon at the very end. I mean, even if required... Probably Dhoni is good enough. He can bat with uh, any other person from the lower middle order. But in such a case, they may retain Hardik Pandya, not send him out to push singles. But it remains to be seen. The other thing, of course, is Karthik. I think what I read is that Karthik is sort of chosen as a backup keeper rather than a backup middle order bat. right? So they will back uh, Dhoni to go all the way through the tournament as the first choice keeper, of course. And Karthik only comes into the picture if and only if Dhoni can't play back niggles, what not. So, but do you think um, as the team progresses or the as the tournament progresses, this team might be able to use Karthik, the batter as well, somewhere in the middle order, five, six, something like this? I'll point out something that I pointed out to the other guys on, on my pod. Karthik yeah. batted at four when we won the won the Champions Trophy in 2013. Right, right. And so, he did but, very well all in right, England. All right. So, I, I don't... I wouldn't put it past him to come make, make the number four slot his own halfway through the tournament. Because he, he, he's right. done well at that slot in these conditions. He's got mm. the experience. We just need to back him. I mean, there's a little bit of confusion as to what his role is. Is he a finisher? Is he someone who can bat longer mm. periods? He hasn't been given an extended run in any uh, in any position. Right. And that's part of the issue. He's one of those players who need needs a little bit of love, and mm. he's he's a complete team man. You can see it from him, right? He'll do anything right. for the team. So, I I can see it happening halfway through the IP, uh, halfway through the World Cup that he comes in at number four. But who knows with this with this team management, Shastri and Kohli, what they've got up their sleeves. Yeah. Well, I mean, just a small point there that way I see it is that at this stage in his career, he's more of a finisher because what we saw is when there is a dichotomy of what needs to happen, he struggles. But when there is an absolute clarity in his mind that, you know, there's 12 balls, I need to hit 30, otherwise we'll lose. He's, he does better. I think that clarity of what needs to happen is sort of better, especially in a chase situation, I would say. But I mean, but that doesn't mean we rule out the chance that he could bat up the order and sort of own one of those positions himself. It remains to be seen. Let's see how that goes. All right. So uh, we've, I think we've done a fairly good analysis of all the players in the squad. Anybody we've missed out or anybody that you'd like to just add a couple of points more on, DJ? So it's interesting that the World Cup squad came out uh, during the IPL because I think if it had come out a little bit after the IPL or mm. towards the end of the IPL, we may have seen a few other names because Manish Pandey is back in form. Right. Absolutely. And he was one of the first contenders for that number four spot. Of course, I think he, they didn't do right by him anyway. Go on. Yeah, yeah. so there, there's a bit of uh, contention there. Um, mm-hmm. There's also Shubman Gill, who looks All like right. a serious player, that kid. I mean, um, to see those guys bat like that at their age is just incredible. Mm. Right, um, right. And as you said, Shreyas Gopal, um, I think he could have really pushed Chahal for his spot. But, mm. I mean, it came out halfway through the IPL. It's been the squad that India has gone with for a long time. And I suppose that you just need to draw a line at some point and say, this is the squad. I mean, yes, Gopal and these guys have done well. But 
we'll try them out for the next one. Of course, I mean, there it's their time to come, I'm sure. But yeah, another small plus, how plus Seni shirts. as well, actually. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, Seni is, is a good pick. I mean, he could be sort of a backup. I think nobody can replace Bumrah, but you know, if comes if if a push comes to sho- shove, he could be sort of taking Bhuneshwar spot, maybe. Yeah, and I know you guys are Test match uh, aficionados, so imagine uh, Seni and Bumrah steaming in for India, right? How good Fantastic. would that be? Fantastic. I mean, Seni bowls 150 plus. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Quite often. Yeah. 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 Man, in spite of a bowler like him and a bowler like Chahal and so on, well, let's not go into RCB, right? No, no, All no, right. no. Please not. <laughs> All right. So, um, anyway, so that that was a. I think that was a pretty exhaustive discussion about the squad and some players around it. So now we were to quickly go to our predictions. So, uh, DJ, I think you can go first. What are the matches you think that India will lose, right? So, I mean, as I said, all their matches are uh, home match. Uh, sorry, are uh, early starts. They start at 10:30, and uh, you know, if if I were to quickly go through the, um, let's say the itinerary, I'll just quickly also make it available to you. So it's basically they are playing first of all South Africa. On the 5th of June, then they start against uh, Australia. Uh, 9th of June, 13th of June is New Zealand. Then 16th is Pakistan. 22nd is Afghanistan. 27th is West Indies. 30th is England. 2nd of July is Bangladesh. And 6th of July is Sri Lanka. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, TJ? I mean, maybe you can just tell us, you know, uh, which matches you think India might lose. That's the fastest way. So look, this this is a tight World Cup. It's a 10-team World Cup. So you've got to remember these are the top 10 teams in the world. So there are going to be no easy matches. Right. I think that we might struggle against Australia All right. at the Oval because uh, it's going to be a good batting pitch. And we've mm-hmm. lost to Australia recently. The, the last three games we played against them, we lost. And mm-hmm. uh, so I think we'll struggle there. Mm-hmm. I think we... Depending on the conditions in Trent Bridge, if they're seeming conditions, then New Zealand will have an advantage there in Trent mm. Bridge. Mm. We're actually going to watch that match. So I, I think perfect. those two are difficult matches for us. Mm-hmm. And I think I think we'll beat England because the focus has been on beating England. So we'll do that. But I think there'll be a surprise against the West Indies. Right. Because the, the West Indies look like serious cricketers again. Very, mm-hmm. very suddenly, it's come from nowhere. Right. But I mean, they've got all these massive big hitters, these quick bowlers, good fielders, and they're playing 50 over cricket like it's an extension of 20 over cricket. So, yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'd be wary of Australia, New Zealand, and the West Indies. I'm Nothing not saying yet? we're going to lose. All I right. think we'll beat right. England because the focus has been on preparing to beat England. I right. think we'll beat Pakistan because they're inconsistent. I think we'll beat South Africa because they have injuries. Mm-hmm. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, I think we'll manage to beat as well. Yeah. Um, but I think those three are the ones that I'm not saying we'll lose. I think we'll we won't win easily. I think it'll be a fight. So we might lose one or two of those games, not all three. All right. So effectively, you are going to say India take seven the, to eight know. wins. Fine. Seven to eight. Wins. Fine. Out of ten. All right. So Giri, would you like to go? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say India will win eight of their matches. I'm, as I said uh, before, yeah. I'm an eternal optimist when it comes to predictions. Mm-hmm. Um, so the tough one I see here is against England in home conditions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stick with England there. Apart from that, close calls between Australia uh, and Pakistan. Pakistan, you know, they're sporadic. They come out of nowhere sometimes. And Pakistan will probably be playing their third or fourth match. Also firing on all cylinders by then, hopefully. Uh, though they might be close ones to call, but I still go, I'm still going to say India will win uh, those close matches. Mm-hmm. Lose against England, so eight wins and one loss. Right. Okay. Then for me, I'm going to be the eternal pessimist, of course. So I'm going to say India are going to win six or seven matches rather than eight or nine. Yeah. So for me, I think um, I think the England match. I think India might win this. But one, I agree with DJ when it comes to Australia. The second one, yeah, I think, you know, I would rather 
I would rather think they will beat Pakistan, but also I think New Zealand could be tight, and England. Look, it it for me, it's it's the, how the day starts for me uh, because uh, India and England are more or less evenly matched, and if anything, if England bat first, it's it's going to be very difficult for India, I think there. So uh, let's see how that goes. So I'm going to say I'm going to give India six or seven max number of wins and two definite losses in this group stage. But I mean, if you were to go a bit further, but however, I think India will easily make the knockouts, and unless they play Australia in the semi-finals, I would rather I'm going to stick my neck out here and say India will take this World Cup. DJ. It's a big call, man. I hope they do. Yep, yep I just. <laughs> I do. hope they do. All right. Um, I, I I really hope they do. Is is what I would say. It, it's it's a World Cup in the country I live in. It would be right. incredible for me to just be part of the celebration of that. But mm. it's mm. not easy winning a World Cup, man. It, it's you need some luck. You need good cricket, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. You need good weather. So it, it looks like winter is never ending here. So it, it's <laughs> been raining and it's been cold. So hopefully that clears up by the end of this month. But I hope you're out right, man. And but I just think it's it's a tight, tight World Cup. Those top four teams are so close together. Mm. I right. think they will make will make the knockouts. I think it'll be India, Australia, um, India, Australia, England, and New Zealand that will make the knockouts. But on any given day, any mm. of them can beat the other. So if India is playing uh, the finals, India is India are in the finals. You've got mm. to go and watch that match. Because I think you bring good luck to them. Yeah. You've already yeah, done it once. You've can you already done it once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well. I'm happy to go and watch it as long as you can get me a ticket because it's impossible to get any tickets to this. Mm. But more than Let's happy to turn up. Let's keep in touch. You never know. Absolutely. Absolutely. But but which are the matches you're going to watch uh, live? So we're going to India South Africa, which is in Southampton. Um, we are going to India New Zealand, which is in Trent Bridge, and. Yes. India, Afghanistan, which I think is in yeah, Southampton. Southampton, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I've got tickets to Australia, Pakistan through a friend as well. So I'll be going to that match hoping both of them lose. Wow. All right. That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> that rain wins. All right. That's but not, not uh, Old Trafford, India, Pakistan. No, I have. I mean, I don't know anyone who's got tickets to India, Pakistan, to be honest. Yeah. I genuinely don't. Um, I don't know where the tickets have all gone because I think people who have them have kept really quiet. Yeah, because otherwise yeah, yeah. people might ask for them. So, yeah, no, not heard of anyone who's got India-Pakistan tickets. I, I, so I happen you... to hear of one actually this weekend. Last weekend when we went to play, one of my uh, teammates in my team boasted he has a ticket. So we'll have to do something about this. You need All... to become friends with that guy. How many tickets or does he have? Only one. But we'll have it. We'll have. I mean, there are other ways, right? So let's talk about it off air. Understood. Sure. Understood. All right. All right. So um, uh, going further. Uh, thanks a lot first of all i would like to say you know this was a very nice banter i love this discussion um, i like the to and fro as well and uh, it would be great if you know we could also involve you as a guest uh, sometime later um, when you find time and maybe during the world cups we also plan to bring back some of our guests for another you know a spot discussion on how the matches have gone on and so on so if we are able to accommodate each other i think that would be great if you can join us dj or absolutely our, absolutely i would love to be back on the, on the pod it would, it's a, it's been a great chat i've really enjoyed it it's brought back some serious memories and it's uh, actually made me aware of how much cricket i've watched growing up so wow indeed <laughs> all right all right so anything to plug yeah, absolutely. So, guys, thanks for listening to uh, to this chat. Um, we are an Indian cricket-focused podcast called Edges and Sledges. We have done over 50 episodes. I think we're going to come out with episode 59 later this week uh, around the IPL final, kind of previewing the final as well as um, discussing the result of the Delhi Capital versus CSK Qualifier 2, which is on Friday. Okay. We are available on all major platforms, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple, iTunes, um, Google Podcasts, CastBox, basically wherever you get your podcasts, we're available. We're on Twitter at one tip, one hand, the number one tip, the number one hand, like the catching rule in street street cricket. Mm -hmm. We are on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Write us an email. We're contact at one tip one hand dot com. It's the three of us that do the podcast. It's myself, DJ, Varun, and Ashwin, and we do it every week. Um, 
and it's it's all about Indian cricket. It's about the big happenings uh, around the world on cricket, and it's it's basically like what you guys do. It's a bunch of friends that come together and and chat cricket because I mean we would do that anyway. We just as you said just decided to put a phone in the middle and and record it. So mm-hmm. I'm also really happy that you guys are doing this because it's great to see like the fan podcasting community growing because I think Indian cricket actually lacks lacks that. We've got a lot of big boys like ESPN, Crick Info and those guys doing their podcast. But unlike other countries, there are no fan based podcasts and it, it's great to see that coming up more and more. There's you guys, there's another podcast called the Fourth Seat Podcast. You've got yeah. um it's cricket show. So 81 all out so it, it, there are lots of really good podcasts going out there so it's also really good for us to connect with you guys so thank you very much for having us on the show it, it's it's been an incredible chat with two passionate cricket fans so keep doing what you're doing guys thanks a lot thank you thanks a lot all right then um i think it's time to bring this section to a close uh thank you once again tj and we'll catch up soon absolutely pleasure wow wasn't that a fascinating banter that we had with DJ from Edges and uh, Sledges podcast? Right, Ajit? Yes, yes. And now that uh, we've looked at India's chances at the World Cup, I think this week's trivia question should also be centered around India's World Cup performances so far. So the trivia question for this week is, statistically in terms of wins and losses, which was the worst ODI World Cup for India? Right. So you can write in your answers to us. Uh, in multiple ways, you could get in touch with us on Twitter at Armchair Pod or via our Facebook page. Or also you can leave us an answer using the, the various platforms like on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Podbean or any other app on which you get your podcasts, right? Then you could also write into us at armchair.cricket at gmail.com. So uh, as you've just heard us, we've just done a complete review of all the teams and we have made clear whom we think are the you know the favorites to win the upcoming world cup not only this uh, the ipl 2019 is also coming to a close so uh, in the in our upcoming episodes we'll be reviewing uh, the road to finals and also the maybe the results of the final of 2019 ipl apart from this we have plenty of other international matches coming up and also some of the guests that starred with us or that did some sections with us in the previous episodes would be returning Uh, as we review the World Cup matches. So I hope you can stay tuned in. And uh, I would like to say thanks to all our supporters and listeners from across the world. And if possible, please talk about this podcast with your cricket friends. And uh, we'll see if we can make our podcast better. All right, then. Having said all that, it's a goodbye from me. It's a goodbye from him. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast.